thank you all for coming out on this uh, snowy evening. Um, I'm, am, I, am I supposed to use this, or can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be in Chicago. Um, I've been uh, making good use of my time. I went to the Oriental Institute this afternoon to look at um, some of the, uh, the exhibits there, and it was uh, quite rewarding. Um, uh, this, this, this project, I should give credit to uh, Jennifer Piscopo and Laurel Weldon, who've also been collaborating with me in parts of the project um, that I'll talk about today. Um, now, the conditions of women's lives uh, vary dramatically across societies, and the laws and policies uh, to improve those conditions, to promote women's equal status and opportunity, um, also vary. Uh, these policies have changed generally for the better um, since the 1960s, but there are still considerable differences across societies. So we think of Saudi Arabia and Pakistan as places where laws on women's rights are quite um, restrictive, and Sweden and Norway, on the other hand, as places where um, feminist laws have advanced um, to a considerable degree. But in the vast majority of countries, the situation is not so clear-cut. Um, women's rights have advanced in some policy areas, but not in others. Um, consider the United States. The United States has been a pioneer in the liberalization of laws on abortion and in policies to prevent and punish violence against women. But it lags every other advanced democracy in not offering um, publicly paid maternity leave or parental leave and not offering any nationally or even state paid publicly funded um, childcare policies. Um, Bangladesh and India have quite progressive policies now to address the problem of violence against women, but they've hung on to um, religious personal laws that severely restrict women's rights and access um, to divorce, to property, to guardianship over their children, to inheritance, um, and so forth. Um, so it's this picture of selective advances in women's rights um, that I want to uh, focus on today. Okay, I want to sort of paint you a picture of these selective advances and then try to explain um, why we're seeing uh, this kind of picture. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the project is part of a larger um, NSF-funded study that is covering 70 countries, um, a 40-year time span, and 13 different uh, policy areas. But I'm not going to cover the entire study today. I'm just going to talk about the Latin American part um, and uh, mostly about three, um, three issue areas. So this is just going to give you an overview of some of the material um, that we're going to cover today. Um, so what are these selective advances? I'm going to uh, present you with some evidence about big uh, gains in women's um, presence in politics due to gender quota laws currently in place in 13 Latin American countries. Um, uh, advances in policies to prevent and punish violence against women. Um, I'll also sort of refer uh, in brief to um, the endorsement of women's equal rights in the family. Um, but on the other hand, there's been almost no liberalizing reform on abortion. Um, laws on abortion have stayed the same since the modern um, criminal codes were promulgated in the 1920s to the 1940s. And in fact, to the extent that there has been legislative change, it's largely been in the other direction. Um, in El Salvador in 1997 and Nicaragua in 2006, uh, the criminal code was reformed uh, for a total ban on abortion. So to the extent that there has been, there are some exceptions, um, which I'll talk about uh, later on, but to the extent that there has been legislative change, it's been in the restrictive direction. Um, so then I'll present um, our theoretical argument explaining or trying to account for the selective nature of, of advances in women's rights. Um, and I'm basically going to argue that the difference between issues turns on whether or not the policy challenges the core tenets of religious doctrine. Um, and then, on the other hand, whether or not it's a gender status policy advancing women's status as a group or whether it's a class-based issue that challenges state market relations. Um, finally, in the conclusion, um, I'll just talk very briefly, um, perhaps provocatively, about the issue of gay marriage, which is a doctrinal issue, challenging religious doctrine, but it also seems to be making, um, making some headway uh, with this you know, unprecedented legalization of gay marriage in Argentina uh, recently. Okay, so this is the first sort of case study area. I'm going to talk about two areas, 
where women's rights have, cons have progressed a lot in the region. Um, political presence and gender quotas, and then violence against women, and then I'll move to a discussion of abortion, which has deadlocked, if not moved in the opposite direction. So women's presence in politics, as many of us know, has grown steadily in the region um, from an average of 13% of the lower um, and single houses of parliament in 2000 to 21% in 2010. So that's an eight percentage point increase in 10 years, which is actually um, quite a big jump. Um, this cross na uh, the cross-national variation, um, so this is an average figure, right, which obscures pretty significant differences um, between countries, which I'll show you in the next slide, uh, is largely due to these gender quota laws. Gender quota laws far outweigh the effects of uh, GDP, um, the general level of gender equality in society, as well as women's education. And in fact, in South American countries, there is a negative correlation between GDP and women's presence in parliament. So if you think countries like Bolivia and Ecuador have many more women in parliament than do Chile and Brazil. So there's a negative correlation. Um, so you can see that starting in 1980, the trend of women's presence in power is you know, a huge, uh, it's quite a steep line um, going up from under 5% to over 20. Um, now there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of variation as I indicated. So this also has Caribbean countries in it, which is a little bit distracting. Argentina, almost 40% of the Congress is female right now. Costa Rica, um, also almost 40%. But then we have a country like Brazil, where women are still only 9% of Congress. Chile, 14%. Um, Colombia, 12%. So there is a huge variation. Even though on average the trend is up, there's a huge variation. Um, so I've said that this variation is largely due to these gender quota laws. And this table just gives you a sense of uh, the, the, the significant number of countries. So 13 out of a total of 19 Latin American countries, the vast majority of Latin American countries now have a gender quota law. This is a significant regional trend, and Latin America is actually the only region where the majority of countries have a statutory law. So there are other regions where countries have um, you know, voluntary quotas adopted by parties, but not necessarily a statutory law obliging all parties to field a minimum percentage of women candidates. So if we look at Argentina, the Argentine law dating from 1991 requires par that a minimum percentage, 30% of political party candidates, um, be women. Um, why quotas? Well, I just mentioned the case of Argentina. Uh, this was actually the first statutory gender quota law in the world, um, adopted in 1991. Uh, Argentine feminists had been debating the issue of quotas in meetings um, throughout the 80s. They were influenced by the um, Socialist Party of Spain, which had been um, using uh, just internal party quotas. Um, some um, feminists in the Peronist Party convinced then-President Carlos Menem that it was his duty to support the quotas. And he also felt that since um, Eva Perón had introduced quotas in the Peronist Party in the 1950s, that this was part of the Peronist tradition. At that time, um, women's presence in parliament was at a really low level, only about 6%, whereas during sort of the Peronist reign of the 1950s, it had been in the 20s. And so Menem, um, and I'm, this is, this is I, I, I had a, an interview um, with his interior minister, who was um, actually quite decisive in the debates about quotas, and he said that um, Menem thought that it was something um, that the party had to go down in history as doing, that they wanted to go down in history as the ones responsible for this you know, historic move to advance women's political rights. And so um, he convinced the Peronist Party uh, uh, caucus in Congress to support the quotas, and Argentina enacted this historic law. Um, after the Argentine law, um, Argentine women politicians traveled around the region to uh, feminist meetings, meetings with other politicians, and talked about their experience. And in this way, the idea of quotas, um, the text of the law, started traveling across national borders. Um, then the uh, Fourth World Conference on Women happened in Beijing in 1995, and quotas were also um, a hot topic on the agenda of Beijing. The Beijing platform sort of endorsed quotas, and um, Brazilian politicians I interviewed, for example, in the 90s said, well, we came back from Beijing with quota bills in hand. 
you know, we were really excited by this idea. And so then they came back and introduced a quota proposal into the Brazilian legislature. So in this way, the sort of idea from Argentina became transnationalized. Um, I also want to add um, an argument I'm making in some of my work on political representation, that gender quotas, in contrast to um, uh, legislative reservations, so reserved seats for racial and ethnic minorities, are a form of party-controlled inclusion. Okay, so the gender quota works by the party taking individuals into itself and elevating them to positions of power within the party. Legislative reservations for indigenous people, for Afro-descendants, actually threaten the party because they carve out spe you know, a certain percentage of legislative seats that are going to be held by members of different parties, by indigenous parties, by Afro-descendant parties. And so they actually alter or modify the balance of power in the party system. So if you're you know, a member of a dominant party, it's much more acceptable or palatable, it's less threatening to adopt a gender quota than it is to make room for you know, a minority ethnic party. Um, so that's why I think we see um, you know, gender quotas in 13 countries, but uh, ethnic reservations in only two, only in Colombia and Venezuela do we see any ethnic reservations, and the number of seats is very small. Um, two Senate seats in Colombia, three congressional seats in Venezuela, and another um, three congressional seats in Colombia. So um, that's also a big, another question that I'm working on, is you know, why the gender quotas um, and so few um, racial or ethnic reservations. Um, I'm just gonna, we can talk about the effectiveness of quota laws um, later on in the question and answer. I wanna move on to talk about um, violence against women. So gender quotas, again, is a success case for the Latin American region. A lot of progress has been made. Violence against women is another sort of successful case. Um, uh, in fact, it's an area where Latin America has been a pioneer among developing countries in addressing the issue. Um, by violence against women, I'm referring to actually a range of different practices. Um, rape, uh, intimate or domestic abuse, stalking, trafficking, female genital mutilation, honor killing, or um, uh, widow burning, sati. It was the women's movement that actually created this umbrella concept, violence against women, to kind of group together practices which had previously been seen as um, completely separate. Uh, this has been a top priority um, of the global women's movement. Um, there's a lot of testimony about when you know women from different uh, national backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, social classes get together. This is always a theme that emerges and a theme that, around which there's little disagreement. Um, so if you talk about class policies like you know, maternity leave, um, there might be a, a, so, some disagreements. But on this issue, everybody is generally united that there has to be um, action. Um, it's been on the agenda of feminist movements in Latin America and the Caribbean at least since 1981. Um, when the first uh, regional feminist Encuentro uh, named uh, November 21st as the day against violence against women. Um, and I said that the region has been a global pioneer. Brazil was the first country in the world to create um, women's police stations in 1985, um, you know, almost uh, during the dictatorship. Um, now, one thing that Laurel Weldon and I have done in our um, big study is to create an index um, of policies on violence against women. So, you know, we, how are you going to compare the policies adopted by 70 countries? Well, we've come up with um, this, you know, zero to 10 index. And it's simple, but we've basically given each country a point for um, different types of policies. So up at the beginning, I mean, this is, is this just an impossible slide? Um, I mean, is it, is it all um, legible? So, so points for services to victims. Are there domestic violence shelters? Are there rape crisis centers? Are there services for victims of FGM, stalking, etc.? Three points for legal reform. Is there specialized legislation? Has there been legal reform? So for example, um, in many Latin American countries, rape was considered a crime not against a person, but against custom. What's more, it was a crime that only the victim could initiate a lawsuit about. So the public prosecutor's office in the state 
could not initiate a suit or it couldn't initiate like a, a criminal, a criminal um, investigation against a rapist. So if the woman desisted, the state would, you know, there was no prosecution. So that's the kind of legislation we're looking at. Is there a legislation to typify, you know, rape as a crime? Is there a legislation to name the crime of domestic violence or domestic abuse? Um, other points for programs targeted to vulnerable populations, training professionals like judges, police officers, uh, prevention programs, and administrative reforms. Okay, so that's our zero to 10 index. And in this way, you know, we can uh, compare sort of progress on the problem across a vast um, number of countries. So how do the Latin American scores look? Um, the first thing you can see in this table is that there is massive change over time. So there's almost, except for Cuba. So these are the Latin American countries in our study. Um, uh, um, so if you look at the 75 column, there's really not much going on. There's more going on by 85, and then there are huge changes between 85 and 95, and 95 and 2005. Um, down here in the final row, you see the average score, but this is low because Cuba, um, again, hasn't done much, and so Cuba's dragging um, the regional average down. And this inaction on the part of Cuba is sort of generally characteristic of um, post-socialist, socialist, and communist states. Okay, so the communist states are very good at dealing with equality in the family. Very good on sort of, by good I mean sort of progressive, liberal, whatever, on reproductive rights, but terrible on violence against women. Um, and that's because this is an issue that's really brought to the public agenda by autonomous women's movements, you know, working from civil society, working outside of dominant political parties, state institutions. And if the regime doesn't permit civil society activity, then the issue can't be politicized. So we even find that in, um, in countries like Sweden and Norway, they were actually quite late to take action on violence against women because of this lack of autonomy of the feminist movement. Whereas in the US and Canada, the feminist movement has always been autonomous from parties in the state. And so violence against women was a policy um, that, that, a policy that was initiated uh, much, much earlier. So like I said, huge changes over time, especially between um, 85 and 2005. Um, I've already sort of hinted about the reasons for this change over time. It's really an issue um, that feminists have organized around and introduced to policy agendas. Um, and I mean feminists working from civil society and also feminists who've decided to leave civil society and join sort of women's policy machineries in the state. Um, it's an issue around which there's, there are a lot of global norms and agreements and um, also regional agreements. So the Inter-American Convention on Violence Against Women um, signed in Brazil in 1994 uh, directly led to this sort of wave of domestic violence legislation in the region. So in the mid to late 90s, there were like 14 countries that adopted specialized legislation on domestic violence because of this um, regional agreement. Okay, so that's the second sort of successful case, policies on violence against women. The first one was gender uh, quotas and political representation. Now, um, the issue of abortion. Completely different picture. Um, virtually no change since the promulgation of modern criminal codes. And I should just add, because I'm kind of a, a dork about these things, that um, these early Latin American criminal codes were quite progressive, progressive at the time they were adopted. So in 1921, um, when Argentina's criminal code was, uh, was adopted, Argentina became the first country in the world to permit abortions on women who had been raped. It was an issue that had been discussed in Europe because a lot of criminologists were concerned about the um, uh, rape of European women by invading armies during World War I. And there was a, it was part of um, this draft version of, uh, of this criminal code in Switzerland. And so when Argentine criminologists came around to drafting a proposal for um, the criminal code there, they kind of just copied the Swiss, the Swiss um, draft bill. Um, and so at the time, and, and, and then this Argentine code was then very influential for um, criminal code reform in the rest of the region. But 
once, in, once adopted, you know, 80, 90 years ago, they've been frozen. Meanwhile, starting in 1967, when um, the UK liberalized its abortion law, most countries of the West have really loosened restrictions on abortion. It's gone from being considered a crime in virtually every circumstance to being um, largely liberalized, uh, at least in the first trimester, across um, virtually all of Europe and North America. So in this time of sort of worldwide liberalization of abortion, the laws on Latin America have stayed um, the same. Now, there are two exceptions. So I'm saying that the laws have stayed the same. There's been no liberalization. There are a couple exceptions in both directions. Um, but the two liberalizing exceptions, um, a Supreme Court decision in Colombia in 2006 and Mexico City's dramatic legalization of abortion in 2007, neither involved a national legislature. So in Colombia, the Supreme Court responded to a lawyer's petition and ruled that abortion um, is not punishable. They, so they sort of stretched the grounds under which abortion wouldn't be punishable to include rape, uh, fetal abnormality, or the life or health of the pregnant woman. Um, Mexico City, you know, dramatically legalized abortion um, in the first trimester of pregnancy. But it was just uh, the, the federal district. And in response, um, 19 states amended their constitutions to protect life at the moment of conception. So they had, you know, a reform in one direction and it triggered a backlash. So in fact, um, in Latin America, the trend has been the opposite. Chile in 1989, El Salvador in 96, and Nic El Salvador in 97, actually that's wrong, and Nicaragua in, in 2006 banned all abortions. And I'm, you've probably read about this in the New York Times, and it's been quite, um, quite controversial. So um, again, this is the Tun Weldon Index of Abortion Laws, and it's not exactly a, a point because it, it's harder to, to map onto abortion policy, but basically um, a nine is, um, you know, elective abortion in the first trimester. A zero is abortion permitted under all circumstances. A 10, uh, I think only China gets a 10, um, meaning like, you know, no problem, first trimester, second trimester. But China, I think, has no restrictions at all, even late in pregnancy. Um, and then uh, a, a zero is, is all circumstances. And so, but basically it's sort of a hard thing to score because there's some countries with um, cause models, so abortion is permitted only for a cause. There's some countries with, you know, timing models depending on the, you know, the week of pregnancy and so forth. So it's a bit, it's, it's, it's less straightforward than a point for every, you know, violence policy. Um, so where do the Latin American countries um, Stand up. Well, you see again that Cuba is an outlier, but in the completely opposite direction, right? So Cuba has um, extremely liberal laws on abortion. Um, and the rest of the countries, with the exception of Uruguay, are extremely restrictive. So abortion is either not permitted at all, permitted um, only for women who've been raped, or where the pregnancy threatens um, the mother's life. Um, Uruguay uh, does permit abortion on social grounds, um, I think for socioeconomic reasons. And that's the way that, um, that, that dates from their criminal code, I think in the 1930s. So the original code just um, was, was, was more liberal. Um, if you look at the sub-regional averages, the Caribbean is more liberal. Um, so the score, the overall score is higher, but if you look at, look at the Mexico and Central America, you can see the effect of um, the El Salvador and Nicaragua change was to drag the score down from a 3 to a 2.2, whereas in South America, it stayed um, pretty, pretty consistent. But again, it's at 2, whereas in violence, the scores of many countries were around, you know, 8. Um, so how can we explain this discrepancy? I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, how can we explain this discrepancy? I've read all of this evidence that you know, there's a lot of change um, in some women's rights areas on gender quotas and on violence against women. There's a policy deadlock on abortion. So Laurel and I in our project, um, you know, one of our main motivations is to challenge the pervasive idea 
that women's rights is a single basket and that all good things tend to go together. So that, you know, the fact that laws on, you know, family equality, violence against women, abortion, parental leave, that they all were kind of bundled together in the West and changed between the 70s and the 90s in a progressive direction, that that means that, you know, women's rights are part of a single, change on women's rights is part of a single process. Um, we think that is, you know, fundamentally not true, that in fact, um, gender equality and women's rights is an incredibly complex and complicated package of issues, um, but that we can gain some analytical clarity and sort of theoretically separate, you know, what makes some women's rights different from others. So the current status of this project is that we have um, sort of two dimensions that we're disaggregating women's rights on. Um, the first dimension is this doctrinal or non-doctrinal dimension. So do the policies challenge the um, established doctrine of religious groups or the codified tradition of um, major cultural groups or we've even made it so broad as to say the sacred discourse of certain cultures? So are they doctrinal or non-doctrinal policies? Uh, the second dimension we use to differentiate uh, gender status policies. So policies that improve the status of, of women as a sort of status group, um, which is a term that we get from Nancy Fraser, who got it from um, Max Weber. So a group sort of constituted by patterns of cultural value, um, as opposed to a class, which is a group that is um, constituted by its relationship to the means of production. So women have, as Fraser says, sort of this bivalent uh, characteristic. They're on the one hand a status group, but they're also a social class positioned um, by the sexual division of labor. So women have in common that, you know, they're sort of uh, almost universally held responsible for child, work, uh, child care, housework, caring for, you know, dependents in the private sphere. Um, but as uh, work, as labor, uh, private sphere or reproductive labor can be bought and sold. So women who are middle class or wealthy can pay other people, generally women, to do their reproductive labor. So women of different social classes then have a different relationship to the sexual division of labor. Um, some can pay other people to do it. Others rely on family members or on the state. So these class policies then, um, not only do they challenge state market relations, but they also divide women. And we find that, um, we find that on gender status policies, the women's movement, the United Women's Movement, um, tends to drive change, whereas on class policies, it's more likely to be um, left parties or um, unions who are driving change, because women and the women's movement are actually quite divided about issues like publicly funded childcare, uh, publicly funded parental and maternity leave. Um, so uh, do these policies challenge, anyway, you've, got, you've gotten the picture here. If you look at the non-doctrinal policies, you see gender quotas, violence against women, constitutional equality, uh, parental leave, federal funds for child care, and workplace equality. The doctrinal ones, abortion, family law, you know, uh, contraceptives. Separating gender status and class is really what, what differentiates the class policy is state funding, public funding. Um, or not. So this is, so here, so abortion is doctrinal in general, but the mere legality of abortion is a status issue affecting all women. Whether abortions are publicly funded then is a class issue primarily affecting poor women. Okay, and basically, um, as you might be already guessing, Latin America has made considerable progress in this quadrant. The non-doctrinal gender status issues driven by the women's movement, but like zero here, in the doctrinal issues. Um, so let me go back. Okay, so why the policy deadlock on abortion? Um, it challenges, you know, religious belief, uh, calls out um, the Roman Catholic bishops to defend, you know, principles that they hold um, quite dear. Um, but I think it's important to move beyond, you know, this simplistic view that you see in much of the literature that, oh, the church is strong in Latin America, and so, you know, abortion laws stay the same. Well, in fact, if you look at traditional measures of church strength, 
the church in Latin America is actually weak. And those measures would be sort of number of priests per Catholic and number of seminarians per Catholic. Uh, by those indicators, the church in Europe and in the United States is much stronger than in Latin America. So I think that we have to have you know, a more sort of uh, subtle and nuanced picture of how the church and religious organizations influence politics. Um, and so I prefer actually to put the sort of burden of activity or the burden of agency on the politicians, not necessarily on the bishops. I mean, the bishops are just doing what the bishops are going to do. I mean, they're going to defend sort of Catholic doctrine and their moral principles. But so why do the politicians listen? Um, that's what we need to explain why the politicians are susceptible to these kinds of influences. Well, bishops and priests can tarnish the reputation of politicians by calling them immoral and unchristian. And this can be quite damaging because uh, the church is the most trusted institution in Latin American civil societies. People have far more confidence in it than they do in the army, uh, in the presidency, and especially in political parties. So this is, this is old data, but, but this is, if you look sort of from 1995 to 2005 in the Latino barometro polls, um, I mean 71% are, say that they have confidence in the church. And the next closest contender is 40% in the military. I mean, that's a 30 percentage point difference. So the church is revered and you know, has quite a tremendous amount of moral authority. The other institutions, especially political parties, do not. And there was only one, one year in a like 10 or 15 year period when confidence in the church dipped below a 71%. Um, in the US, a 2006 Harris poll uh, found that the churches were in sixth place in levels of public confidence behind the Supreme Court, um, behind the military. Okay, so if a politician, you know, especially during election time, says that you know, so-and-so senator who said that they were going to back you know, a bill to liberalize abortion is immoral, that can be, that's quite threatening. So it's, at least what I've observed is fear of church wrath constitutes a huge disincentive for any politician to get um, behind a project to liberalize these restrictive abortion laws. What's more, um, and I've made myself not very popular uh, in some of the literature for saying this, but many Latin Americans remain ambivalent about abortion if you look at public opinion polls. So it's not an issue that many politicians think they're going to gain a lot by backing. Um, and for the middle and upper classes, uh, safe abortions are relatively easy to obtain. So it's um, you know, in the criminal code, but uh, it, with some exceptions, um, is practiced with you know, impunity, but in terrible, dangerous conditions, especially for um, uh, poorer people of, of fewer means. Um, I just wanted to, um, so, let's see, um, give you a little bit of a picture of the, cl the class issues, which we haven't analyzed um, the data on quite yet. Um, but by the logic of, of, of class issues, um, I would say that there's also been a little progress. It requires sort of you know, strong programmatic left parties, at least the experience in Europe, strong programmatic left parties to um, pursue change on class issues. And yet in Latin America, policies on maternity leave, no country has a policy on parental leave. So the big sort of gender neutral countries of Europe and even Japan have you know, a year, two years, even three years of gender neutral parental leave. It can be taken by either parent and it's paid. In Japan, you can get up to three years paid. Not fully paid, but in lots of countries, you can get a year fully paid. Um, but th these policies have remained unchanged basically since um, labor codes were promulgated. And you know, the maximum in Colombia at four months, but generally anywhere from three to four months of paid leave. So it's, I guess, more progressive than the US where the leave is 12 weeks but unpaid. And even that was actually quite difficult to obtain, only with the Family and Medical Leave Act of, I think, um, just 15 years ago. Before that, there was no guarantee of, uh, of, 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 of leave after childbirth in the US, no federal guarantee, and now it's unpaid. At least in Latin America, it's paid.
Um, so Latin America has made progress on gender status, non-doctrinal issues, almost no change on doctrinal issues, and some change. Um, you know, there's some municipalities that have child care policies, uh, but far fewer change on parental leave and child care. And another reason, you know, is that uh, with a large informal sector and huge social inequalities, there's a pool of um, domestic labor that most middle and upper classes uh, tap into for child care and housework. Um, this is just summarizing where Latin America is uh, in our um, policy typology. Um, so I just want to wrap up now um, by speculating a bit about what some of the implications of this argument would be for uh, the gay marriage issue. Um, uh, there are movements in many countries uh, to legalize gay marriage. Um, bills under consideration in Congress in uh, Colombia, Brazil, um, many different places, Central American countries. Uh, none have been as successful as um, Argentina and Mexico City, which legalized gay marriage in 2009 and 2008, um, respectively. And I think this took a lot of people by surprise, and um, I've been, you know, puzzled by it because I've been somebody studying, you know, the politics of abortion um, for, you know, over 15 years. And abortion, there's been, you know, a long history of activism. It's been on the agenda for a long time. Gay marriage sort of emerges on the agenda relatively recently. It's hugely contentious. It's doctrinal. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church is extremely opposed to it. And then it passes in a national law without actually that much legislative debate. Um, so this is, I think, you know, a really uh, compelling puzzle. Um, why? Well, we can point to some obvious factors. I'm not sure that they really explain uh, the policy change. But it turns out that, um, I mean, Spain had legalized gay marriage a few years before. Uh, Spain um, also has a lot of sort of foreign aid directed toward Latin America. And I've just read that the Spanish sort of foreign assistance priorities included the promotion of um, LGBT rights. And a lot of Spanish um, gay groups actually were applying to grant for grants to do more sort of activism around gay rights um, in Latin America. And um, there were some Spanish activists that even got close to President Cristina Kirchner and tried to tell her that this was an important policy change. She had to support it and so forth. So there was a lot of sort of diffusion of ideas and resources from Spain to Argentina. Um, there was transnational activism around the issue. And then um, some political scientists argue that um, the Kirchners being extremely, you know, sort of calculating electoral politicians saw a small sort of margin of a few percentage points that they were trying to get. They were trying to get sort of the, the hip and progressive like vote in the city of Buenos Aires, which you know, is not going to go to the machinist Peronists normally. But they thought that if they got behind this issue, that would be enough to swing just three or four percentage points um, uh, in, in you know, margin, margin in their favor. So there are all sorts of theories. Um, my, my, you know, I think that, that, that to get at this issue, it's probably most interesting to compare it to abortion. Like, what is it about gay marriage that created this window, this possibility for change, whereas abortion has stayed um, stagnant? Um, so in, 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 the, in our theory of gender as an institution, which underlies uh, this typology of gender policy, you know, we say that gender involves the um, status hierarchy, the sexual division of labor, and also normative heterosexuality. So, you know, gay marriage touches upon normative heterosexuality. It intersects with other gender institutions, but it's not completely collapsed by them. Um, gay marriage also um, conforms to a discourse of equality and human rights. So in my conversations with some Argentine friends, uh, they said that they would talk to people on the street or in taxis. And the taxi driver would say, oh yeah, you know, I think we should support this because you know, everybody should have equal rights. And then the taxi driver would go on to make like, a whole bunch of homophobic remarks. But it was sort of, this is an, as an issue of equal rights, 
um, which Evan Gerstmann, scholar, American scholar Evan Gerstmann, has also tried to argue for the gay marriage debate in the U.S. So the, the, the discourse of equal rights has somehow been um, effective. By contrast, I've argued that the, human, the pervasiveness of equal human rights discourse can actually be counterproductive to people advocating for change on abortion because um, especially in you know, uh, post-transition dictatorship, post-transition democracies transitioning from dictatorship, um, you know, who are concerned to, uh, to improve their human rights credentials, people arguing about the equal human rights of the most innocent, the fetus, those arguments can be quite powerful. So um, there isn't sort of a countervailing interest. There isn't an injured party, arguably, damaged by gay marriage. Whereas arguably, people can say in the case of abortion, there is an injured party. There is a right being abrogated. Um, two other final points. Um, a bigger threat to gender roles. Gay marriage has been criticized as reinforcing marriage as the site of rights, reinforcing the importance of um, monogamous coupling as a site of rights, and therefore being quite um, conservative, when in fact maybe we should be um, you know, focusing on single mother-headed households, extended families, grandparents raising children, and extending rights to these diverse family forms instead of reifying marriage as the ideal family form. Um, so arguably, uh, abortion, could po abortion also, in Kristen Luker's argument, by rendering motherhood um, optional as opposed to compulsory, abortion arguably uh, represents a bigger threat to gender roles. Finally, just one last comment and then I'll um, wrap up. The protagonists in the gay marriage movement are mostly men. The protagonists in the movement to liberalize abortion are women. So is this just, you know, pure sexism? that men get what they want um, and women have a harder time. That's sort of a pessimistic note to end on, but um, I'm really looking forward to your comments and questions, so uh, that's how I'll end for tonight. Thank you very much for coming. So let me answer you in the specific and in the general, um, starting with the specific, because I think you're asking a question about violence, but you're also bringing up a broader issue about um, you know, the, the general gap between law and practice. And if by studying law we have anything to say about you know, actual empowerment, actual equality, actual situation on the ground. Um, and the answer is um, not necessarily, but that's still OK. Uh, but let me just talk about the violence against women. Um, uh, are they effective? Well, so are they being enforced? Um, sometimes and sometimes not. Uh, we, don't have, um, we don't have good data on it. I mean, the data on this in a systematic way do not exist. There are small anecdotal studies, you know, like SEPIA, a women's a feminist organization in, in Rio, you know, have done studies uh, for a long time looking at the women's police station, seeing do they have the resources that they need, you know, do they have vehicles? <laughs> Are the staff there trained? And the answers are not always good ones. Um, 
So a lot of these policies um, can exist uh, you know, on paper, and even when they exist on more than paper, they're not always um, tremendously effective. Uh, but it's really hard to have a huge cross-national study on implementation. And so I think that where we can, we'll supplement it with data on implementation, um, but, but, but we don't have it systematically. The, the, the second issue is, do these policies lead to a reduction in the incidence of violence? And that's not clear. That's not clear either, um, but we may find out. We're talking with um, a woman named Lori Heisey right now about doing a big study. She has um, participated in a World Health Organization study where they've actually done like 14,000 interviews in 15 countries, detailed interviews um, about you know, exposure to violence and a whole bunch of other questions. And so they're going to be able to study at the individual level like what effects um, you know, uh, one's pr uh, likelihood to be a victim of violence, they're coming to us um, right now because they haven't found a, a sort of systematic pattern. And they think that some of our policy variables might actually help uh, sort this out. So it could be, but since there's very little data on incidents of violence that's comparable cross-nationally, it's also, it's also hard to tell. Uh, the research that does exist shows that um, exit the ability to exit from an abusive relationship by owning land, having access to a good job, um, is crucial to reduce one's risk of violence. Um, but the policy measures, especially public awareness campaigns, the existence of shelters to have a place to exit to, anecdotally, they're important, but you know, in a global way, um, we don't know. Finally, let me just mention briefly so there's a gap, especially in the Latin American region where, you know, we always joke that the, the law is para inglês ver, right, as you say in Brazil. Um, there's going to be a big gap between the law and practice. Um, does that render a study like this um, pointless? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think that the law has tremendous normative power um, even when there's a gap between the law and social practice. It crafts social identities. It distributes, you know, power. Um, it, you know, upholds asymmetrical relations of power between, you know, couples, between men and women. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a site, a focus for social mobilization. So I think that the law is always, always worth studying, even when it may be suspended um, and, and at odds with social reality. So I think that looking at policy is still important as long as we remain conscious that it's not always going um, to map on to, to social practice. This question always comes up. People are always like, all right, yeah, sorry. Um, you were talking a little bit about the political calculus that politicians make in order, for example, to get the time of gay marriage. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on why they would care about this 10% of the population, uh, their vote, versus getting behind women's rights, which it, Assumably, it's 50% of the vote. Is it because women don't care so much about these issues themselves, or they have other things they care more about, uh, like economy or anything else that comes to mind, um, in order to make their decision when voting? And um, what about, because I understand abortion is a little bit tricky because of all these things you said at the end that there is a victim. But for example, in Latin America, the case of divorce, uh, maybe a politician saying, I'm going to pick a life. Uh, abortion, uh, abortion might have a hard time, but divorce, assumably, maybe women would be more um, in favor of it. Um, not everybody thinks that abortion advances the rights of women. Many people think it doesn't. Um, you know, if you look at the, the public opinion data, and there's not a lot, and sometimes the questions are wrong, but the World Values Survey, for example, finds that um, most Latin Americans support or think that it's okay, that abortion is okay only under a limited range of circumstances. So, for example, because you have too many children or because you don't have a job, that's, it's not okay. So I think that public opinion is actually quite ambivalent if not restrictive. So, so I think that, you know, because, so that abortion advances a woman's right, it's 50% of the population, why shouldn't a politician get behind that? I think it's not at all clear cut um, among the public that abortion advances women's rights. 
and it's a huge electoral issue. I mean, the, the recently elected president of Brazil, I don't know if you followed the abortion controversy during the election, but she, um, Juma, uh, had to promise to the bishops that she was not going to change laws on abortion because she had made some statements in the past indicating that you know, she was actually behind you know, liberalizing Brazil's restrictive laws. And there was such a stink um, that she had to promise that she wouldn't. And what's so ironic about the situation is that José Serra, her opponent, was a, you know, proclaiming himself to be against abortion and you know, the defender of church values. When he was health minister during the Cardozo administration, uh, there was a discussion in Congress about um, requiring all public hospitals in Brazil to perform those abortions permitted by law, meaning abortions on women who had been raped, right? Because previously, even if a woman had been raped, it was very difficult to obtain a legal abortion. Um, and Martha, Martha Suplicy had a bill in Congress which was you know, causing a huge amount of controversy. So Seja, as health minister, just uh, came up, just um, promulgated um, an administrative norm, just single-handedly requiring all Brazilian public hospitals, this was in 2002, to perform legal abortions. So just totally, you know, went around the congressional democratic debate, you know, through an act of the executive, said, you know, had the, probably the single most important advance in abortion rights in Brazil um, since 1940. Uh, he was behind this, and then he comes, you know, uh, less than 10 years later as the champion of church views on conservative, you know, abortion. It's just ridiculous. Um, but, 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 but generally, I think that um, it's not an issue of political gain. It's not an issue of political gain because there isn't a strong constituency behind it, and that's what makes abortion different from divorce. I mean, divorce had tens of thousands of people in the street in Brazil in the 70s. And in Argentina, there's tens of thousands of people in the streets supporting the legalization of divorce. Abortion has never attracted that kind of popular mobilization. Um. Yes? I just want to piggyback on this. I know you just talked about Latin America. You said your largest program project includes Asia and India. Yes. Uh, India has had a very liberal abortion policy laws right from the 60s. And this is not the empire of the men, but this is because of the population problem, the sex in the mobile population The irony is that since the late 70s and 80s, in, in the original state in India, in Punjab, the sex ratio is 810 per thousand. 810 per thousand men. Because of anger sentences were introduced in the country, and some are scams that all facilitated female uh, safety. So abortion per se doesn't empower women as in the same sense. And I think China has a similar case, exactly. where because of one-time policy and preference for male child, there's the abandonment of the female child. 
confrontation of consequences that the women are going to be representing. The, in which in the constant scene in which a woman is going to be, her husband is going to, who is to have used to uh, contest the election, is going to nominate his wife to this. So the women are going to are not going to be the, the real women are not going to be only proxies in the person. I mean, I think that what's fascinating is that both of your examples, um, I mean, you're challenging whether sort of uh, uh, guarantees of women's presence in parliament as well as abortion is actually, you know, evidence of a woman's right or, uh, in fact, a tool to oppress and, um, you know, retard the advancement of women's rights. And I think certainly um, in the case of, you know, sex-selective abortions, it, it, it is. It is. But that doesn't mean that we can, um, that's, 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 that's the way it's being used, uh, and I think we need to be aware of that, but I don't think it, um, I think that the fundamental issue is whether there's a choice and whether, you know, reproductive freedom is... Who chooses? In an extremely uh, sexist society where the conditions of choice do not exist, I think that the issues you're raising are, are pertinent. So you're saying that, I mean, you're saying that the, 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 uh, the ability to exercise rights depends on broader social circumstances. And so we need to keep an eye toward those broader social circumstances when we're theorizing these as rights. I, I, I agree with that. Um, can I just talk about the political representation? Okay. India made a mistake by guaranteeing women's um, presence through uh, these legislative reservations um, and not through party quotas. And they did it because, you know, India has had um, the, the reservations for scheduled castes and tribes, right? So, I mean, they basically set aside certain single-member district constituencies where only members of scheduled castes and tribes can run. And now only women can run, and they'll be, they'll be rotating. But this isn't the way that any democracy promotes women's representation. Um, women are not a geographically separate group or even a separate party. I mean, women in most democracies are always integrated into mainstream parties. Um, they, you know, occupy spaces in social classes and parties with men. And so a separate constituency is sort of an odd, it's, 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 it's an odd way to, um, to, to, to engineer women's representation. And that's arguably why um, uh, the, the project is subject to these criticisms of being dominated by upper caste, women being... Uh, uh, taken over by women who are mere proxies for their husbands and fathers and brothers. Um, so I think that that's, that's a mistake and in fact there have been um, critical voices from the Indian feminist movement saying that instead of these reserved seats they should be talking about quotas, party quotas. Um, so I think that institutionally it's a mess. Um, the other thing that's interesting about India is the way that um, uh, opposing the uniform civil code has also become a feminist project. Right, upholding separate personal laws which continue to discriminate against women is what feminists are endorsing because the Uniform Civil Code Project has been associated with Hindu nationalism and you know, um, uh, uh, oppression of Muslim minorities. So in India, I think that there are all sorts of transpositions that complicate the story. Yeah, so, sorry. And, and here I'm talking just about the Latin American case, not, not, not about what would we do if we tried to find an indicator across the world of a uh, of, of movement in the direction of gender equality. But within the Latin American case, given reasonably uniform trends away from traditional marriage you know, in, in a lot of countries, it's easy for me to understand why gay marriage would be a different sort of, uh, of political issue than, 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 than abortion is. Um, it, it's, it's possible, I guess, to, to have an, an, an optic against which all of these speak to, to gender equality. But I guess I, I, I've got questions also about, about your method, and this is a second question. Maybe you'd like to respond to this, and maybe you weren't talking in this talk about, uh, about all of these being dimensions of, uh, of gender equality. But my, my second question is, why not include uh, legislation regarding prostitution, and legislation regarding uh, domestic work and, uh, and, and, and the conditions of domestic work. Those are both complexly, or each, I should say, complexly gendered uh, 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 social practices, complexly legislated 
uh, uh, issues which have been addressed by feminists and by, by people interested in sexual liberation, in gender policy, and, and so forth. And, and they too, I think, would introduce a complication uh, to, 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 to your desire to have a sort of uniform set of indicators that boil down to gender equality. I, I, that may be too big a question. No, no, no. I, I, please don't don't apologize in advance of your questions. I think you're raising, um, you know, excellent excellent issue, and and I think that, you know, both of you have really raised the issue of the extent to which abortion belongs in you know a typology of so-called you know women's rights and gender equalities when its use can be. I mean, and it's not just that abortion is used as a tool to. Um, uh, to you know, eliminate girl babies, but obviously in China and in um, you know in, in the Soviet Union and also in Cuba, I mean, abortion is a population control tool forced on you know women in order to facilitate their participation in the labor force. So you know, it has a quite ambivalent status as a public as a public policy issue. So do so do prostitution and domestic work. Um, I mean, I think there's a tremendous amount of disagreement about whether you know, I mean, Brazil, the right to prostitute oneself is guaranteed in Brazil. It's not here. In most states, um, what you know, what is it? I think there's a lot of ambivalence. Same with same with domestic work. I mean, a lot of people would say that that laws um, uh, guaranteeing domestic workers the right to you know participate in a social insurance system are advancing women's rights. But there are some people who say that um, there it's 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 uh, buying into an unequal situation which oppresses poor women. So, um, so I don't really have a good answer as to why we left prostitution and domestic work out of the 13 policy areas that we were considering. I don't. Um, there are also important issues like citizenship laws. Do women have the right to pass on their citizenship to their children? We are not considering those either. I mean, I think that we should. I think that we should consider those. As a first cut in this project, um, we're not, we can't do everything. It's already a huge amount. But I think that you know, to 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 to, to gather you know data on these issues in the future, I think is 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 compelling, and I'm particularly interested in them because of their their ambivalence and their status as uh, as, as as questionable advances in women's rights. Yeah. 
let me respond. You asked three questions, and I'm going to answer the second one first. Um, feminism and the, and, and the quota system. I mean, I think that um, it's important to be clear about what gender quotas and women's presence and power can achieve and what it can't. And there has been, um, I think, a sense of, of disappointment among many feminists because they thought that gender quotas and putting women into power would lead to a lot of policy change, you know, in feminist, if not that feminist consciousness in the legislature, when in fact um, that, 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 that hasn't clearly happened um, everywhere. And so, you know, f feminists I've interviewed, um, so when I was in Argentina last December, um, I sat with my friend Marcela Durier, who was actually a, you know, one of, the, one of the main forces behind the 1991 quota law, and I sort of said to her, you know, as an architect of the quota law, 20 years later, what do, what do you think? And I mean, I think that what they say now is that this is a cultural change to have women there, regardless of what they do. You know, that the mere presence is important, and if policy change comes, okay, but, but, but that's not really what it was about. I don't think that's what they said in the 80s. I think in the 80s it was all about women, they're going to bring a new perspective and new voices and humanize politics. And so now it's changing a bit. So the, the expectations about the quotas are, are, are changing because um, uh, uh, um, many of the women there are just as um, part of dynastic political families um, and part of machine politics as are the men. Um, you know, um, so I think that the, the, the disappointment is not just about Argentina, but in Bolivia too, there has been some, some, some disappointment. Um, I just want to address, I mean, both of you, again, have, have, have talked about what is, what is driving um, the gay marriage. And underlying um, your, your comments is, I think, a, a, a more general argument about social practices changing, you know, family structures changing, family forms changing, the traditional family eroding, and therefore, you know, that opening the door for gay marriage and not being surprising. But that's never been the way that the law has changed in Latin America. I mean, divorce and separation was the reality for decades before divorce was legalized in Argentina, Brazil, and Chile, and Colombia and Paraguay too. I mean, there was, there was, a, there was a lag of decades between sort of declining rates of marriage, the formation of de facto families, um, separations and, and the ability to, to change divorce. So I think in highly sort of especially doctrinal issues, uh, there's, 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 there's really not a sense that the law responds to social practice. And in our larger statistical analysis of family law reform, there's no relationship between female labor force participation, you know, GDP, women's roles in society, and family law reform. There's not. I mean, the big, um, this is statistical analysis, but the big effects are whether you're in the Middle East, whether you're a former communist country, or whether you have a British colonial history. Those are the three biggest effects we're finding to explain family law change. But, you know, I thought that female labor force participation would be important because it's a structural change putting pressure on restrictive property laws, you know, divorce and so forth, but it's not. It's not. I mean, so I think that the, in general, for some of these policy areas, the social practice argument doesn't, doesn't hold. Um, sex education. I mean, in Argentina, sex education, reproductive rights, and contraceptives have been hugely controversial. I mean, the IUD was also hugely controversial. And, um, you know, Catholic forces were involved in discussions about whether the IUD could be on the list of, of, of contraceptives distributed or paid for by the state. And that's a, doctrin that's a doctrinal issue. But I think it's not the same as abortion. I think that there's, there, you know, historically we've observed that there's, that, that it's more of a bargainable issue, bargainable, um, than abortion is. But the implementation problems are vast. Yeah, the implementation problems are vast. Okay, I think we can do one more question and then we have a little reception as usual out here in which uh, anyone else can frame a question. Here's a question back. Um, yeah, hi. Um, sorry, I entered late. I just finished class across midway at the law school. Um, so I have kind of a three questions, but maybe we can talk about them at the reception or something. Um, the first one is, well, I'm a third year law student. Next year, I'm going to be doing LGBT refugee work in Ecuador. So exactly what it sounds like, LGBT refugee work in Ecuador. So I'd be doing their cases. And so from that perspective, um, the group that I'm working, first, do you have any research on these? on these topics that, you're, that you were discussing on gender-based violence in Ecuador. Um, 
is specifically lesbians and trans women, and or is there a reason why you didn't include that in your study, or at least not in this final presentation of the study? Uh, second thing was, what do you think about the role of the U.S. not as a government, but individual like U.S. trained people, nonprofit people, activists, lawyers, um, going and um, trying to help, um, you know, rights abuses in in like Latin America. Um, you know, how do they do it and not seem like condescending or imperialistic or something like that? You know, how do they do it in like a sensitive and appropriate, culturally appropriate fashion? Um, and for the last bit, for gay marriage, I just have a thought. Um, do you think that although the Roman Catholic Church is against LGBT, you know, issues in general, um, the fact that they're essentially like allowing more people to partic participate in this religious fact practice is a factor, um, like in, in how much it's been supported? Love it. Um. No, I I congratulate you for going out and doing this work. I think it's you know going to be going to be going to be interesting if challenging. Um, but just on, on your last comment, I actually I don't I don't think it would be accurate to say that the Roman Catholic Church is opposed to LGBT issues. Um, I think that you know in terms of, of 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 rights to be free from violence and discrimination, the church is on board. I mean everybody is you know an. A, 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 um, an equal an equal person. So I think it's you know important to say when it comes to marriage, yes. I mean marriage is a sacrament involving you know a man and a woman. So the Roman Catholic Church has been opposed to you know gay marriage, but not to gay rights per se. I mean it depends on what kind of rights we're talking about, but not not to gay rights per se. I mean I think the human rights to be free from violence and oppression, you'll find allies in religious organizations. It's just the marriage issue which is going to provoke um, some conflict. Ecuador is not in the study um, uh, because we generally picked the, the, the countries. No, it is. Wait, is Ecuador in our study? Why am I not? It's not in our study. Yeah, it's not in the study. It's not in the study. Um, it's not in the study. We picked countries where we had world values survey data on religiosity. Um, and it wasn't one of those. Uh, in retrospect, the World Value Survey data on religiosity is not terribly good, so we probably could reconsider, you know, our case selection. And there's some more African countries I'd like to include as well, you know, in a future iteration. But that sort of explains part of the initial cut that religiosity was a main independent variable I wanted to focus on, and so we had to kind of limit the the selection to those to those countries. Um, you know, the issue of U.S. trained people going and imposing their views. In the early 90s, when I was thinking about what I wanted to write my dissertation on, I mean, I knew I was fascinated by Brazil, and I wanted to write, I wanted to do research on race. Um, but the discussion about race in Brazil at that time was not like it is now. You know, nobody really wanted to talk about race. Or if they did, it was just to say, oh, that's an American thing. You know, here we don't really have race discrimination or racial distinctions. And so I decided to work on gender instead because everybody could talk about, you know, women and gender and stuff like that. So, um, you know, now, of course, zillions of people are going and doing their projects on race in Brazil. But at that time, it was, it was delicate and I didn't want to feel like I was in the position of, of forcing. I think that now there's a pervasive LGBT discourse in most countries. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, be, be, con be, be, concerned about, be concerned about that. In fact, I know a lot of people working on these issues. If you want later, I can put you in touch with them. But I think that, you know, the climate has changed where it's not a theme that's going to be perceived as, you know, U.S. imperialism. Okay, well, please uh, join me in thanking you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.